Hi everybody. This video we are looking at the um, concept of the Bohr shift or the Bohr effect. Uh, so we're basically looking at how the affinity of haemoglobin for oxygen changes in different parts of the body. So this is an oxygen dissociation curve. And what we can see here along the x-axis we've got the partial pressure of oxygen in kilopascals it's basically just the same idea the same concept as the concentration of oxygen so as we move from left to right here we have an increasing um, concentration of oxygen and then the y-axis we can see we've got the percentage saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen so up in this area here where we would have a very high partial pressure of oxygen this is what it's like in the lungs so obviously the lungs are being regularly ventilated with air so there's a lot of oxygen present and when we have these very high uh, partial pressures of oxygen we see that there's a very high saturation of haemoglobin so 98 percent of the haemoglobin is bound to oxygen so there is a very high affinity of haemoglobin for oxygen at these high partial pressures. Lower down this way though, and um, this is what we would see in the respiring tissues. Um, and the partial pressure of oxygen in respiring tissues varies. Uh, it can be anywhere sort of in this sort of range. It depends on what tissue it is. It depends on the activity level um, at the time. If we just pick an example of three kilopascals, so that is quite low, but we can see that we've got a percentage saturation of haemoglobin of only 36%. So in those respiring tissue areas, then haemoglobin has a much lower affinity for oxygen than it does in the lungs. So what that means is, as the blood moves from the lungs to the respiring tissue, as it gets to the respiring tissue, that means that oxygen gets unloaded. It unbinds from the haemoglobin, which then releases it for use in aerobic respiration in the tissues. So we need to explain uh, a couple of things. We need to explain why that happens. So why is it that oxygen unloads? Um, and we also need to think about why this is, uh, this is a curve. Why is it not a straight line? Because what we can see with this curve is that uh, a very small, so this steep section here, uh, just quite a small decrease in the partial pressure leads to a large decrease in the percentage saturation. It's not a straight line. So there's a few things that we need to explain. So in terms of why the oxygen um, binds and unbinds, this is all to do with the fact that we've got a reversible reaction. Now, I will say at the moment that later in this uh, video, we'll also look at the effect of carbon dioxide because the presence of carbon dioxide um, also has an effect on the affinity of the haemoglobin with oxygen. But even without that, we need to understand a little bit about why the oxygen um, binds and unbinds, or it just doesn't really make much sense. You will not need to explain this bit about the reversible reactions, but I think it helps to sort of understand what's going on. So this is the reaction we're talking about. So um, Hb, um, that's just what we write to represent haemoglobin. Obviously, haemoglobin is a protein, so this is not the formula for haemoglobin, but we write it as Hb. So haemoglobin plus oxygen uh, will form oxyhemoglobin, and this is a reversible reaction, so it can go in both ways. So in the lungs, where we know there's a high partial pressure of oxygen, um, we could represent the reaction like this. Now, again, this is not um, supposed to show any sort of a balanced equation. It's just a representation so we can understand what's happening. So here we've got haemoglobin molecules. Here we've got oxygen molecules. And here we've got oxyhemoglobin. So what you can see here, this is what we might see in terms of uh, the sort of equilibrium state. If we increase, though, the concentration of oxygen, the partial pressure of oxygen, so this is a uh, very high partial pressure, as we see in the lungs. When you have a reversible reaction, the, um, the balance of the reaction can shift depending on the situation. So in this situation, when you have a high um, a concentration of your reactants, then the forward reaction is favoured. So that means that the forward reaction happens more than the reverse reaction. So what that means is that haemoglobin binds to oxygen to form 
oxyhemoglobin. So because there is more oxygen available, more oxyhemoglobin is formed because the forward reaction is favoured. In the respiring tissues, then we, we basically see the reverse. So we've got a low partial pressure of oxygen. Now, if we say that here we've got the oxyhemoglobin, which has travelled in the blood from the lungs, but we've now got a very low partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs. So we are going to favour the reverse reaction. And this is, this is uh, chemistry principles. So if you want to know more about this and understand this a bit more, have a look at the chemistry principles, the Chatelier's principle, um, if you want to. You don't need to, but if you want to, that's what you can have a look at. So the reverse reaction is favoured, which means that the oxygen unbinds from the haemoglobin. <coughs> Excuse me. And therefore, more oxygen is available here. So that's why oxygen will bind or unbind to the haemoglobin in those different parts of the body. It's all to do with the reversible reaction and the equilibrium balance. In terms of explaining why we have this very steep section here and why we've got this S-shaped curve overall, is to do with something called cooperative binding. Uh, so here we have the lungs, so we know that in the lungs high partial pressure of oxygen and if we imagine the haemoglobin, we know it's made of four polypeptide chains, two alpha globins, two beta globins. So in the lungs, all four of those haemoglobin um, polypeptide chains will have an oxygen molecule bound to them. So one oxygen molecule is able to bind to each polypeptide chain in the haemoglobin molecule. Obviously, bear in mind, that there are thousands and thousands of haemoglobin molecules in each red blood cell. So 98% of uh, oxygen saturation. So not every single red uh, haemoglobin molecule will have four bound. That would be 100%, but the majority do. If we move down uh, to here, so we reduce the partial pressure of oxygen, then what happens is rather than having an oxygen molecule bound to each of the polypeptide chains, we get oxygen uh, dissociation, so the oxygen will unbind. So one of those oxygen molecules unbinds um, and is released. If we then move further and decrease the concentration of oxygen, the partial pressure of oxygen even more, then we get an additional oxygen being released. But the important thing is that as one oxygen gets released here, that changes the configuration of the whole haemoglobin molecule and it makes it less able to stay bound to the other haemoglobin molecules. So at this point, so as, as soon as an oxygen molecule is released, it alters the configuration of the, uh, the polypeptide chains, which means it is much easier to lose the second molecule. And that's why you need only a small decrease in the partial pressure to lose that second molecule, whereas here, to lose the first molecule, you needed, needed quite a large decrease. As soon as one molecule of oxygen is lost, it makes it easier to lose the next. And then again, as soon as we lose the second, it makes it easier to lose the, less, the, 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 the third. So this is the idea of cooperative binding. It goes the other way as well. So as soon as one oxygen molecule binds to one of the polypeptide chains, it makes it easier for a second molecule to bind, which then makes it easier for a third molecule to bind. So because of that, we see this very steep section in the middle here, and overall we get this S-shaped dissociation curve. So now we want to look at the effect of carbon dioxide. So we've already explained that the oxygen will bind and unbind anyway as the partial pressure changes. Um, but as I said before, carbon dioxide also has a very big effect, and this is really important uh, when we're thinking about what's happening in the body. So here's our regular dissociation curve. So uh, this curve re represents sort of like a, a normal carbon dioxide um, concentrations or pressures. If we add this line here, though, this represents the um, oxygen dissociation curve when there's a much higher partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So this would be 
the state of the case of the tissues, for example. So um, if you take any partial pressure of oxygen, uh, and if we take a partial pressure of five, because that's what we get in respiring tissues, it's normally about a five um, kilopascal partial pressure of oxygen in the respiring tissues. What you can see here, this is um, the percentage saturation that you would see if you had normal carbon dioxide levels. So normal carbon dioxide levels, you'd see around sort of a 70% saturation of the, of the haemoglobin with the oxygen. So obviously, as we've seen already, what that's telling us is that if you have oxygen bound to the haemoglobin in the lungs, as that uh, haemoglobin, as, as the blood travels to the respiring tissues, uh, we see this decrease in pressure. And so we're going to see um, oxygen dissociate until only about 70% of um, the haemoglobin is bound to the oxygen. So that's what would happen normally. However, as you can see from the graph, if we are in the respiring tissues, there is a much higher partial pressure of carbon dioxide compared to if we're not in the respiring tissues. So because we've got a high partial pressure of carbon dioxide, that shifts the oxygen dissociation curve. So instead of being in this position here in the respiring tissues, we're actually at this position here for the same partial pressure of oxygen. So that means that when the blood moves to the respiring tissues, the oxygen is going to unload anyway but because there's a much higher concentration of carbon dioxide in the respiring tissues, even more oxygen unloads than it would otherwise, which means that we get only a 40% saturation of haemoglobin with oxygen in the respiring tissues. It unloads because the partial pressure of oxygen has reduced, but it unloads even more because is high it means that in the respiring tissues where lots of oxygen is needed that's the whole point we need the oxygen to be released for aerobic respiration so because of this effect of the carbon dioxide which is increased in the tissues because of respiration that then means that more oxygen gets released for the respiration what we can see is that when there is more carbon dioxide the haemoglobin has a lower oxygen affinity or it has a lower affinity for oxygen than it does when there's a higher um, partial pressure of carbon dioxide. The blue curve here shows what we would have if there was a low carbon dioxide concentration. So um, this is what we would see in the lungs because in the lungs obviously the carbon dioxide um, in the blood is removed as we breathe out so there's much lower par partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So Again, if we were to pick um, any partial pressure that we might see in the lungs of oxygen, so let's say about seven, if it was just like a regular carbon dioxide concentration, then we would see um, maybe about like a little bit under 90% of the haemoglobin would be saturated. But as soon as we have, uh, as soon as we decrease the carbon dioxide concentration, which is what we see in the lungs, we see this increase um, in the oxygen affinity. So that means that in the lungs, because there is less carbon dioxide, even more oxygen is able to bind to the haemoglobin. So even more oxygen is able to bind and load, and therefore the haemoglobin carries more oxygen from the lungs down to the tissues. This whole process here is called the Bohr effect. So it's the idea that as we move from lower to higher partial pressure of carbon dioxide, the curve shifts to the right. So the more carbon dioxide there is present, the further to the right the oxygen dissociation curve will shift. What that means is that as you increase the pressure of carbon dioxide, haemoglobin has a lower oxygen affinity, which means that as you increase the um, concentration of carbon dioxide, the pressure of carbon dioxide, more oxygen is going to be released. And that is the Bohr effect. So it's the effect that increasing carbon dioxide has on reducing the oxygen affinity of haemoglobin. So that process helps to um, increase the ability of the body to release oxygen in the respiring tissues so that it is available for respiration. Okay, 
there's some quite complicated concepts there um so you might need to go over it again um but that's all for now thank you